So I really want to thank uh, all of you for coming in here on a Thursday. Uh, <clears throat> Mark Rivera and I have been friends for quite a while. He um, uh, is a head and neck surgeon, sort of uh, extraordinaire, and has been developing an image uh, uh, lab program, uh, mostly using ultrasound, and that matches with some of my work. And so we've crossed paths a couple different times. Uh, and. We have the pleasure of seeing him here. He's actually going to come to lab meeting uh, and present at our lab meeting as well, the more kind of nitty-gritty stuff. But this was going to be a, a general talk. But uh, it is possible for you all to uh, join us in the lab meeting tomorrow. If you want, you can text me. I can tell you where it's going to be. Uh, but Mark was chair at St. Louis for a long time uh, and recently moved to Boston. I want to say four years, five? Yeah, four years, four years ago. And uh, he's really sort of running the clinical operations there as well as uh, doing head and neck, he, he supports that very, very large program. And uh, it's a real pleasure to have him here today to, to talk on uh, uh, management of the oral tongue. So thank you, Mark, for, for coming. Thanks for having me. You guys don't mind, it's a little warm. I'm going to take off my sport coat, <laughs> roll up my sleeves. Um, Selena, you want to turn the lights down maybe yeah. a little bit? Well, thanks so much for uh, for the invitation, Ibn. It's been it's been great getting to know you and watch your work. Uh, uh, it's been really inspiring. Uh, you know, also you know, given that we have similar similar interests, and uh, I can't wait to see. Hey, Taha, how are you? All right, how are you? You guys got one of the best residency on you ever produced right there. In <laughs> <laughs> um, how much do you pay? So, but anyway, it's been it's been great uh, getting a chance to know you and, and follow your work. And so today, this is a very basic talk. It's probably too long, um, <laughs> but it really is going to uh, highlight a lot of issues that I think are really central in the management of early uh, oral tongue cancer. So let's just jump right into it. I have no financial disclosures. So why talk about early oral tongue cancer? Um, you know, this is simple case. PGY2s can do this case. Guys in community practice can do it. Well, it's really because it's with early stage uh, oral tongue cancer where the details of primary site resection and neck management really have the most impact. And it's patients with early disease that the patients are most likely to cure. We operate on a lot of patients that we know have a 50% or less chance of survival. These patients with early oral tongue cancer, so clinical T1 or T2, really are, have curable disease. And we just have to make sure that we do the basic stuff, do it well. Uh, and so this is something I've been striving for and still haven't perfected. And, and I'll share with you some of my, some of my ideas about that. Um, so, so what are we gonna talk about tonight? Some relevant statistics, um, <coughs> issues related to primary site resection. That's where we're gonna spend a good deal of time. And that includes margins, uh, methods of margin analysis, intraoperative guidance. Uh, how to, what about management of the N0 neck? Uh, when is reconstruction necessary? What's the evidence? And what's the role of adjuvant therapy? So just a quick uh, quick summary. Everybody now is aware of the eighth edition changes to oral cavity staging. And, and the big issue now is depth of invasion now matters. It used to be that a, a T1 cancer could be a centimeter deep, right? Now a centimeter deep, uh, you know, upstages it to a T3. So we really are recognizing that depth of invasion is a big deal. Uh, and learning that it has a bigger role to play in, in uh, not only surgical management, but the, but the implementation of adjuvant therapy. And so just, uh, you know, we think about oral, oral tongue cancer, and we just all assume that these patients really do pretty well, but in the end, they actually don't do all that well. Uh, this is out of a uh, SEER database. Uh, it's been 10 years now, but overall survival, if we look at oral tongue cancer, is significantly worse or worse than all <coughs> other sites in the oral cavity. And uh, early stage, this is T1, T2, so uh, N0 uh, tongue cancer, overall survival is 60% at five years. Uh, and if we look at uh, cost of specific, specific survival, a little bit better, 80%. But this is the area where we hope to, to have impact on these patients with early stage disease. If we manage them optimally, hopefully we can bring, that, bring this curve up uh, closer to 100%. All right, so let's talk about primary site resection. And when we talk about primary site resection, we think about surgical margins. And at one of the best perspectives I've seen recently on surgical margins was uh, that provided by Greg Wolf when he did the Hayes-Martin lecture in 2012. 
or 2012. And this was, uh, was summarized in an article in archives, and it's really a tremendous article if you're interested in this topic. And so bear with me, and I'll, I'll quote Dr. Dr. Wolf. Tumor resection margins that are involved with cancer microscopically are also associated with increased risk of failure, and therefore both repeated resection to achieve histologic clear margins and or the addition of adjuvant treatment modalities have been advocated to reduce local tumor failure rates in anticipation of improved survival. That's sort of where we are now. But where are we going to go in the future? Well, we'll address addresses this. It remains true that the vast majority of patients who are cured of their cancer are cured with surgery using traditional definitions <coughs> of surgical margins. However, how will traditional definitions of surgical margins and the current role for head and neck surgery complement innovation in the current era of genomics and personalized medicine? So hopefully we can address some of these uh, concepts uh, later on in the talk. Okay, so margins and uh, adequate of adequacy of resection. And, and my, my thought process is that um, local recurrence is the marker of the effectiveness of primary site surgery. So just keep that in mind as we, as we go through this talk. So it's clear evidence that the wider the resection margins, the lower the risk of local recurrence, which is, again, the best marker of effectiveness of primary site resection. And so we go back to Davidson in 84, who advocated two centimeter margins. And with this wide level of resection, uh, you're going to encompass unseen microscopic tumor extensions that follow the path of least resistance. And with this, he found 91% local control. But I think everyone realizes that a two centimeter margin on every T1 tongue cancer or T2 tongue cancer is going to sacrifice a lot of functional tissue. Uh, and so we need to balance what's a reasonable volume of resected tissue needed to achieve the desired oncologic outcome with that which is required for optimal function. And this is a difficult thing that we have when we're resecting a tongue cancer. We know that every centimeter of, of normal tissue resected is a centimeter potentially of improved outcome from an oncologic standpoint, but a, de a decrement to functional, functional outcome. That's what makes it hard. So how do we define a clear margin? There is still no uniform agreement among clinicians as to what constitutes a clear margin. And so in 1978, this was uh, defined in a landmark article that has really sort of uh, stood the test of time uh, for the most part. So positive means tumor at a cut edge, tumor within half a centimeter of the cut edge, premalignant changes at the cut edge, and carcinoma in side two at the, at the cut edge. And so using this definition, we're going to work through some of the literature. Numerous studies have shown that there's a direct relationship between margin distance and failure to control disease in oral cancer. Let's go through some of those. So Sutton in 2003 looked at 200 patients with oral cavity cancer with no prior treatment. They defined, they used the, the uh, five millimeter, greater than five millimeter is clear, and half their patients had clear margins. Uh, a little bit less than half had close and they had a, a low uh, a number of patients had ink on tumor. But remember, in, a, in the initial definition, these actually patients would be positive. In this study, radiation was given for close and positive margins, tumor nodes, the usual, usual characteristics. And when we look at clear, this is five millimeters or greater, close and involved, you can see that the percent of survival really was statistically different across those three groups. And so Sutton found that using the baseline risk of death with a clear margin as one, the relative risk of death with involved margins was 11.6 and a close margin 2.66. So in their series, they found that radiation did not uh, do much to, uh, to reverse the effects of a positive or close margin. And they found, as many investigators have, have postulated, that closer involved margins are really markers of aggressive tumor behavior, not really an adequate, inadequate tumor, tumor or surgical resection. And there may be something to this. There are bio, certainly there are biological actors that are harder to clear, but not, not all T1s or T2s uh, would fit into that category. Another study um, in 2009 looked at 277 patients, again, with oral cancer, and they set out to determine the independent effect of clear surgical margins in millimeters on five-year survival. Like all these studies, it was retrospective. 
And essentially, they found recurrence-free survival similar between less than two millimeters and positive, and significantly worse than patients with margins greater than or equal to three millimeters. And so this is ink on tumor. This is one or two millimeters. This is three, four, and five. And so they concluded that when controlling for confounding variables, each millimeter increase in clear margins decreased the risk of death at five years by 8%. And they called for a reevaluation of five millimeters as the, as the margin and perhaps uh, three to five could be seen as equal, given that they did not see that difference between survival between three uh, and, um, and five millimeters. Sorry. So this is continuing to be addressed, and our friends at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, uh, published this in 2017. Now, this is oral tongue only, and it, it's important when we look at these studies that uh, to, to look to see how, to, how heterogeneous the populations are. And typically, uh, the, the, groups, the groupings are not so pure. And I think some of the later publications have tried to stratify sites um, uh, more, um, more purely. So this was only oral tongue, 381 patients, all previously untreated. And they looked at the ROC curve uh, analysis used to, um, in patients who do not have a microscopically positive margin, to determine an optimal margin cutoff for local recurrence-free survival. Again, this is the marker of the effectiveness of the site, of the primary site surgery. Uh, and what they found, local recurrence-free survival by margin status, uh, these are uh, percent local recurrence-free survival. So positive zero to two millimeters, or sorry, 0.1 to 2.2 millimeters, and then greater than three to five, kind of all sorted out together. And when they uh, did uh, Cox proportional hazards regression model, uh, only looking at margins, again, positive was significantly different than 0 0.01 to 2.2. And then above that, 2.3 to five seemed to shake out about the same. And similarly, if they looked at um, looking at margin greater than 2.2 millimeters, positive, less than 2.2, and greater than 2.2 all uh, seem to shake out, again, with a significant difference at greater than 2.2 for better local, regional, uh, local uh, recurrence-free survival. So in their multivariate analysis, they showed that when considering factors such as tumor size, PNI, nodal status, margin status, margin status was the most significantly associated factor with local recurrence-free survival. And patients with margins, with a positive margin, were six times more likely to have a local recurrence, and maybe 13 times more likely than a patient with margins two millimeters or greater. So you talk to the authors of the study, and it's like, no, they're not shooting for two millimeters. Obviously, they, they start grossly with one. They hope for five millimeters on final. But where this helps you is really is sorting out adjuvant therapy. Once you've got the final pathology back, what do you do with a two millimeter margin versus a positive margin versus a five millimeter margin? So one more recent study that was looking at, uh, at maybe shrinking margins, this is a study by Sperry, retrospective, all oral cavity cancer, 432 patients. They assess local recurrence rates based upon the minimal minimum, minimal minimum distance from the tumor to the ink main specimen margin. Of note, and we'll talk more about this a little bit later, but intraoperative frozen sections were all taken from the tumor bed, not from the main specimen. And so if, they, if you look at local recurrence rate by distance to the specimen margin, as looked at on the final uh, specimen margins, if you look at less than or zero or positive, the recurrence rate, the relative risk was 4.1. If you consider greater than one is the reference point. Positive was 4.18, less than 1, 2.16, 1, 1.57, 1, and then from 2 on, they really did not see a significant difference. And so if we look at, again, millimeter distance, so dis distance from ink surgical margin, local recurrence rates, they really thought that over 1 millimeter, the curves really flattened out. And it seemed not to matter whether or not um, additional resection was done in an attempt to clear an initially positive margin. 
So they concluded that the local recurrence rate drops off rapidly with at least one millimeter distance from the cut tumor. They thought that the close margin status, so one to five, was a weak predictor of local recurrence. They felt that one millimeter is an adequate cutoff for a clear margin. So uh, this, this runs current to a lot of, uh, a lot of prior literature on, on what is an adequate margin. Uh, additionally, they found that additional resection not, did not improve outcomes. And their frozen sections were taken from the tumor bed. Uh, and intra-op positive margin status was determined on the main specimen retrospectively. So we're going to talk some more about this tumor bed margin versus uh, specimen-based margins uh, as we get a little bit deeper into this talk. All right, so however, there are other advocates of wider margins. So this is a study, a meta-analysis, uh, looking at oral squamous cell carcinoma in patients that were treated only with surgery, no radiation. So this helps kind of uh, wash out the, uh, the confounding factor that radiation therapy as adjuvant therapy will bring to all these retrospective studies. Again, the primary endpoint was local recurrence. So they did the usual, you know, screen many papers and, and basically got down to five papers. Uh, and the definitions of clear margins uh, for four of the five was five millimeters and for one was 10 millimeters. And ultimately, when they pooled, uh, uh, pooled the data, they found that there was a 21% absolute risk reduction at a very significant p-value for margins greater than five millimeters versus less than five millimeters. And lastly, uh, we did a study uh, a few years ago where we looked at 100 plus patients who went oral cancer uh, resections. Uh, the majority of these, vast majority of these patients had frozen sections taken from the resected specimen. And we really wanted to evaluate the distance from the margin uh, and the impact specifically on disease recurrence. And if we look at uh, how overall survival shook out based on uh, millimeters of a, mar of a margin, if we look at the five millimeter margin, there was a significant difference between five millimeters and basically everybody else. Less than five, but not positive, ink on tumor and persistently positive after uh, attempts to re-resect. And the same shook out for disease-free survival. And when we looked at our group specifically with respect to local recurrence, when we had uh, greater than five millimeter negative margin, our local recurrence rate was 3.4%. All the other cohorts, so less than five, but, but still clear, 26%. Positive, resected, negative, 20, 28%. And persistently positive, had a low, low local recurrence rate because they died uh, of regional distant disease. So our conclusion was, was that our low overall local recurrence rate was 18.5% for the entire group, 17.6% when we took the uh, margins from the specimen and 25% from the, from the surgical bed. And we found a statistically significant improvement in local control disease-free and overall survival with a five millimeter or greater radio margin. So my bias, probably like all of our biases, is based on our own experience. So, um, and I, I'd say to all of you, as you, as you, as people of various ages here, as you go through your career, keep track of everything you do, so you know what happens in your hands. So you can kind of, it kind of helps you uh, interpret what happens, or interpret the literature that you read, and you can compare, compare where you are. To, uh, to your colleagues. All right, so a little bit more on margins. How do most head and neck surgeons view margins? We did a survey in 2005 where we surveyed the entire membership of the AHS, and we had 476 respondents, which these days is really high. Uh, I think email fatigue, you know, I think now you do a national survey and you're lucky to get 200 respondents. In this survey, 46% of surgeons agreed with the five millimeter minimum distance for clear margin, which means the majority of respondents uh, believe that something less than five millimeters constitutes a clear margin. So it's more than just the distance, it's also how the frozen sections are taken. And this is where I wanna get into this idea of uh, 
of uh, tumor bed versus resected specimen margins, um, because it really does matter where the margins are taken from. So if, if, we, if we look to our, uh, our head and neck survey, heart, head and neck membership survey, and we, when we ask them whether you take margins from the main specimen or from the tumor bed, 76% of respondents took frozen sections from the tumor bed rather than the main specimen. Uh, and this gives us some difficulties when taking those frozen sections because it's hard to really correlate where in the tumor bed the concerning areas are compared to the main specimen margin. So there's a potential, significant potential risk there for, for sampling error. And so this is basically the question. Do you do margins from here as the tumor comes out? Or do you take the margins from here once the tumor is cut out and do random sampling in a variety of different methods? And so this has been the topic of several recent articles, a uh, relatively large uh, multi-center uh, study retrospective looked at this. Um, again, specifically trying to figure out if uh, sampling of margins from tumor bed resulted in worse local control. And, and they studied three groups. Group one had a resection. The tumor specimen was, was evaluated by the pathologist and the surgeon in the frozen lab. And in most of these cases, nothing further was done. Or if any frozes were taken, they were taken from here. The second group had a resection. The specimen was evaluated by frozen section. Areas of positivity were sampled from the bed in somewhat of a, a kind of a um, thoughtful way, correlating to the findings on the specimen. And then they kind of reassembled the total resection margin orienting the, the newly resected tissue to the prior resected tissue. And then the third group had a cutout and then had uh, specific areas sampled from the tumor bed. Now, interestingly, in this group, <clears throat> the frequency of positive margins was lowest in the first group, highest in the middle group. That's the group where there were margins taken from the specimen and then re-resection. <clears throat> and 24% and in the tumor bed group. Uh, and what they found with the, was that the status of margins <clears throat> from the specimen correlated with local recurrence, but not from the tumor bed. Hmm. So, and, and to consider another part of this study, when they looked at group three, so 24% of those patients had positive margins on the, on the glossectomy specimen. But when they looked at the incidence of positive frozen sections from the bed, they're positive only 7.4% of the time. So there's a discordance here that if you have 24% positive margins on the specimen and you only have 7.4% positivity from the tumor bed, you're probably sa not sampling the right areas. So tumor bed margin sampling was 24% sensitive and 92% specific. And when they compared groups one and two, there was no statistically significant difference between local recurrence-free survival, but there was a difference between group one and three. Uh, um, again, this is tumor specimen mar uh, specimen-based margins versus tumor bed margins. And when they looked at the risk of local recurrence by status, so positive versus negative, on the main glossectomy specimen. Uh, there was a significant difference. So building the case that maybe tumor bed margins in oral cancer are not the most accurate representations of completeness of resection when we look at local recurrence as the, as the uh, parameter that we measure, by which we measure that. Um, so more to think about in the future. So what about frozen sections? So the impact of the use of frozen sections also remains uh, inconclusive. So Byers, a long time ago, said it's clear that one can revise a margin from positive to clear with the use of frozen sections, but the impact on local recurrence and survival has not been consistently demonstrated. And this was in a paper where he actually showed in his small series, retrospective series, that if they had a positive resected to clear, the local recurrence rate was the same as patients that were initially clear. 
A subsequent study a few years ago from the same institution uh, showed differently, that re margin revision was not effective. So uh, in 2009, there was a study that there was a retrospective study that concluded that failure at the primary site was independently influenced by the status of margins on paraffin section and that the chance of achieving clear margins on paraffin section was not significantly impacted by the use of frozen sections. So this was a series of patients with oral cancer uh, where, they, where they found that, that the use of frozen sections did not impact uh, the ability to, uh, to improve outcomes. And I just note that in this series, and I think you're starting to see my bias, all the frozen sections were taken from the tumor bed, not from the main specimen. So more about, about the efficacy of frozen sections. So we presented this at uh, the academy in the fall. Um, my research fellow, Mustafa Bobo, had, had this great idea to do a meta-analysis looking at uh, the impact of uh, going from an R1 to an R0 resection on local recurrence-free survival. So it was both a systematic review and a meta-analysis. And uh, eight studies met criteria, and we're able to uh, get data from these studies, raw data. So we were able to analyze, in this meta-analysis, over 1,400 patients. And we looked at four groups. I'm going to slow down because this can get confusing if you don't think about it. So group one was initially positive re-resected to clear. And we had to use this terminology clear because of the fact that not everybody uses the same margin standards. Uh, and, when, and, and it came out of this institution, you were on the paper, are you? Uh, that when you go back and look at retrospective pathology data, it's terrible, right? Mm -hmm. So um, initially positive re-resected to clear meant uh, greater than a millimeter, less than five. We compared that group to initially negative. So initial resection margins, all negative. The second group was initially positive, re-resected to truly negative, which meant greater than five millimeters. Comparing that group to the initially negative group. We had a persistently positive after re-resection group that we compared to initially negative, and a persistently positive after re-resection compared to the initially positive re-resected to clear group. That makes sense. So persistently positive versus positive re-resected to clear. <laughs> so if we looked at positive cleared compared to initially negative, we found that the group that was uh, initially positive cleared the negative had a two and a half times greater chance of local failure than the group that was initially negative. And then if we looked at the positive re-resected to negative, so uh, greater than five millimeters compared to initially negative, about the same, about two and a half times worse local recurrence-free survival than those initially clear. And if we look at persistent positive, persistently positive compared to initially negative, those patients do way worse. But interestingly, if you look at persistently positive compared to positive cleared, there's no statistical difference. So that means you think uh, you've cleared a patient, but when you look at this pool data, they actually those patients don't do much different than those that are persi persistently positive. So why is that important? Well, the reason that's important is when we polled surgeons a number of years ago in, in our H&S survey, most respondents felt that a positive margin resected to a negative margin, confirmed by a frozen section, was a true negative margin. So I don't think, I don't, I really don't think you can make that assumption. So unfortunately, the, for oral cavity cancer, the data doesn't support the conclusion when considering local recurrence range, probably due to sampling the wrong area to assess completeness of the resection. So if you, if you do a resection, uh, and you've got a positive margin on the specimen, and you go back and try to re-resect, it's really difficult to know where to re-resect. There was an article many years ago by Carawalla where they, they tried to identify a spot on the, in the tumor bed and had the pa resident of the attending leave the room and had them come back and re-identify the spot, and they're off a third of the time. 
So it's really difficult to, to leave the room and come back and then know exactly where things are. So what about the effectiveness of frozen sections in these R1 to R0 resections? With our current approaches of, of the use of frozen section, revised margins are not equal to initially negative margins when using local recurrence-free survival as a marker of effectiveness of primary site resection. And I think that's, that's the bottom line, is re-resection is not, is not equal to initially negative. And that's where the work that Eben is, Eben is working on really makes a difference. If you can figure out how to completely resect the tumor the first go around, you're gonna end up with less local recurrence than if you have to take a Mohs approach to it. Although there is some Mohs data that's actually pretty good uh, in a few studies, but uh, I don't think we're ready to start doing Mohs surgery in the mouth. This is also very important when we, really when we go to figure out adjuvant therapy. You know, as, as surgeons, we all have egos. And I, and I think a lot of us feel like we have to protect the patient from the radiation therapist. And we say at tumor board, no, I, I cleared that margin. You know, there's no way you need to radiate that patient. Well, you know, um, the data would say that we need to kind of put our egos aside. And, and, and if you have to revise a margin, you cannot consider it clear. One thing to just keep in, in mind, too, we're talking about oral cavity cancer. So this is not necessarily applicable to oral pharynx or larynx. So uh, they want to make sure, that, make sure we don't confuse, confuse different sites. So I think these findings call for a reevaluation of the current methodology of frozen sections. We need a better standardization and probably a large prospective study that evaluates specimen versus patient-based approaches. And so what's the optimal method of resection to margin analysis? Ideally, complete the tumor, completely clear the tumor on the first resection. Given the increased risk of failure related to tumor cut through, and the lack of evidence that additional resection based on frozen section makes a difference. And preferably, my bias is a five millimeter minimum margin, and this is also an NCCN guideline. And then how do we analyze the, the, the tumor? Uh, we assess the margins, including frozens, on the resected specimen because it provides a more accurate representation, representation of the completeness of resection. This is also an NCCN guideline and is a preferred method in the eighth edition of the, of the staging manual, manual. So how do we manage a positive margin on frozen section? You carefully review with the pathologist exactly where the area of positive margin is on the resected specimen. And then we should, you should go back and re-resect at least the quadrant from which the positive margin was found on frozen section to a depth of at least five millimeters. So that would be 10 millimeters gross. And then you take that piece of tissue, keeping it oriented, and you take it back to the pathology lab and you show the pathologist where that, where that is oriented to the prior resection specimen so that they can come up with a cumulative radial margin distance uh, that will inform us as we're trying to figure out adjuvant care, adjuvant therapy for the patient. All right, so what are some potential novel methods that we can use to improve intraoperative margin control? And I'll talk about intraoperative ultrasound a little bit, and I'm just going to touch on work that you all know here very well. So in my experience, the greatest challenge uh, really in oral cancer surgery, particularly oral tongue cancer surgery, is a deep margin because it's just not visible. So it's difficult to accurately feel the true deep margin. And of course, the larger the tumor is, the more difficult this becomes. So a few, a few years ago, uh, a group uh, looked at this using intraoperative ultrasound to assist in T1, T2 oral tongue cancer resections. Uh, and they also use it to predict tumor thickness and help them achieve uh, adequate deep margins. Uh, so this is their schematic. And, and the thing that intrigued me but also really turned me off was this idea of driving needles through the tumor, hollow needles through the tumor in series to help mark where the deep margin needed to be. Uh, I just couldn't imagine sticking needles through a tumor uh, and then resecting around it would, it would be bloody, not to mention the potential for seeding at the deep, at even deeper than the main tumor, where the main tumor is. <clears throat> 
What they did find is if they look, if you look at their deep margin distances, they nearly doubled it. So clearly ultrasound was effective in improving the deep margin status, but the idea of sticking needles through the tumor just didn't, uh, didn't catch on. So we decided to try a little bit different approach uh, and just used our Philips ultrasound probe, um, just like is in, is in many clinics and, and in uh, radiology suites, and started playing with this just to see if we get a feel for how to better identify the deep surgical margin. So this is an example of a relatively endophytic tumor. This was my estimate of the gross margin. This is then our centimeter, centimeter and a half peripheral mucosal margin. And then pretty easy to get the probe in the mouth for the relatively anterior and lateral lesions. And then this is what the image looks like uh, on, on typical cases. So this hypoechoic area represents the tumor. The mucosal surface is here. So you can see this patient that had a one centimeter surface area primary, had a uh, almost nine millimeter deep uh, a tumor. And this is the lingual artery. So it does help you kind of identify some of the ad adjacent structures. So this is um, pretty typical how, how it looks. So this, I believe, is probably some vascularity. Again, this is a hypoechoic uh, tumor. And then, so our approach is to start at one end and start cutting through. When I get halfway through the resection, I stop, and we measure the distance to the deep margin. So this bright line represents air. So this part's all resected. This represents air. This part is intact. And so halfway through, I stop and I check to make sure that I'm adequate. Here we're nine millimeters deep around the deepest part of the tumor. But the reason being, if, if I, at this point, find that I'm too close, I'll stop and I'll sew this back down and start all over again with a, a, a more peripheral, more deep margin to be certain that I encompass it more completely. Again, keeping mainly so I can keep the anatomical orientation of the specimen for the pathologist so they know what they're looking at uh, when I take that to the laboratory. And then once it's out, so this marks anterior, I put it in my hand and I check it again uh, and I get a pretty good image here. Here's the deep margin of the tumor and now this is the cut surface of the resected specimen. And thinking that at some point down the road, we might be able to use this to replace uh, histological deep margin analysis because it's a lot quicker. Uh, and so we're trying to correlate if indeed this is uh, going to pan out as, as, uh, as a safe way to go. And then this just correlates image of uh, prior to resection, image halfway through. So again, this bright light is air. This is the yet to be resected. This is the margin of the tumor. This is the tumor in my hand. Uh, so this is the deep margin of the tumor and this is the resected specimen. So this is our clearance. And this is what it looks like histologically to correlate all, all three of those, all four of those images together. Now, the other thing we're really interested in is to look at the pattern of invasion. So we're in the process of, of looking at our series to see if we can predict irregularity of a margin. If you look at this one case we did a while back, here is the hypoechoic deep margin of the tumor. And you can see this extension. So we saw this in the OR, and I took the specimen up, and we bisected it, and we saw that in the frozen lab. So I think this could be helpful uh, in those tumors that may have a more infiltrative uh, pattern of invasion, again, to avoid uh, uh, a deep positive margin. And so when we looked at our, this was a, uh, the first pass at our analysis, our deep margin cleared the closest deep margin we have is four millimeters. The majority of these were, at this stage, were T1s and mostly T1s and a 1T2. We've had a few more T T2s and T3s. And again, our closest deep margin at this point is <coughs> uh, one, one or two patients with a four millimeter deep margin. So uh, 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 along a more um, in-depth, scientifically uh, robust approach is the work that's done here. And I'll just mention this. Evan's work uh, using uh, IR dye 800 with a uh, link to cetuximab for surgical navigation. And you guys all know this, um, but using uh, a molecular probe with a fluorescent tool to help 
find the molecular basis of the surgical margins. Uh, and uh, I understand this has been ongoing, and we'll hear more about it tomorrow. And again, just a grayscale imaging versus uh, Florence uh, color map fluorescence, and then the, the gross, gross intraoperative photos of a resection. All right, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about neck management. And uh, it's hard to talk about neck management and not bring up this uh, landmark article by De Cruz et al. I think landmark and uh, often criticized paper. It was a great paper, but uh, certainly some difficulties with it. The thing that's really amazing, it was a prospective randomized trial. Uh, they started with 1,200 patients and finished with uh, about 250 in each group. And remember, this, these groups were randomized to either go elective neck dissection versus therapeutic neck dissection. So this is a prospective study of elective neck versus watchful waiting. And ultimately, what they showed was the elective surgery group did better than the therapeutic surgery group with respect to overall survival uh, and disease-free survival. The majority of these patients had oral tongue cancer, so that's, that applies to this talk. Uh, when they looked at the depth of invasion of three millimeters, nodal incidence, nodal metastasis incidence was 5.6%, uh, when four millimeters, 16.8%. So this also reinforces the concept of uh, four millimeters as a cutoff uh, for the need to do an elective neck dissection. Overall survival improved by 12.5% and disease-free survival by 23.6% in the elective surgery group. One of the criticisms of this study is that more patients in the elective surgery group did have postoperative radiation therapy. We have no idea how that, what role that played in the outcomes. So if a neck dissection is indicated in oral cancer surgery, or oral, oral tongue cancer, what levels should be dissected? And probably more importantly, how many nodes should be removed? So I think all of us would agree at least levels one through three. Uh, most of us will do the upper level of four. The issue of uh, nodal yield was addressed uh, by Ziv Gill and his group uh, in a multicenter international pool validation study. They looked at over 1,500 oral cancer patients. These were patients that were all clinically N0. And their goal was to validate nodal yield as an independent prognostic factor uh, in, uh, in outcomes. Uh, and specifically, they wanted to know if nodal yield was a prognostic in a pathologic N0 status. Uh, and does low nodal yield lead to higher local recurrence? And what they found in, when they looked at the cumulative hazard of disease-specific death that the patients with less than, uh, greater than, sorry, less than 18, sorry, <laughs> greater than or equal to 18 nodes did significantly better than those patients that had less than 18 nodes harvested in their selective neck dissection. So when less than 18 nodes were harvested, there was a 50, 40, 80% increased risk of death from squamous cell carcinoma compared to patients that had greater than 18 nodes Harvested. And what was really interesting was that these differences held up when the patients were pathologically N0. So you can, we can talk about what we think might be in play there. All right, I'm going to shift gears from oncologic um, outcomes really to talk a little bit about function uh, just in the last couple minutes of this talk. So when is a free flap required for T1 or T2 defect? There's really almost no high-level evidence to tell us when that's, when that's necessary. As surgeons, we think if the defect extends into the lateral floor mouth, such a primary closure will cause significant decrease in mobility, or if we think there's been significant volume loss. But at this point, most of the time, it's a gut feeling, or we just decide if it's a T2 lesion, we book the patient to have a flap. So this is what we're talking about. This is a patient who had a prior excisional biopsy with positive margins that we're going to re-resect. This is what the resection looks like. Primary closure would bring this mucosal edge to here, resulting in that, and that's not acceptable. That patient will have uh, significantly decreased mobility and problems with articulation uh, and swallowing. So we do this to allow the patient to have 
restoration of cover, restoration of volume, and we use the intact remnant to drive the mobility of the, of the side that's been resected and reconstructed. We want to be able to get to this with these patients. They need to be able to protrude their tongue and they need to be able to move from side to side if they're going to have uh, reasonable function with respect to speech and swallowing. So as I mentioned, there's not a lot of high level evidence about, about what really uh, is important and what the variables are uh, in this group of patients. So there was a pretty well done study a number of years ago um, by Pulowski et al, where they set, to examine, set out to examine relationships of various treatment factors, mainly using modified barium swallow as their, as their um, criteria of, of evaluation. And they looked at 144 patients treated for oral cavity or pharynx. So there's a mixture here, not all oral cavity patients. And they looked at patients that were three months from treatment. And they compared reconstructed uh, and primarily re uh, closed groups. And what they looked at was oral pharyngeal swallowing efficiency of liquid paste and masticated boluses, the percent of oral residue, residue of liquid paste and masticated boluses, pharyngeal transit time of paste, pharyngeal response time of paste, and laryngeal closure duration of liquid. And I'm gonna say this is kind of really boring stuff, but the, the point of this is that unless you collect a lot of data points, you're not gonna learn anything. So one of the reasons why there's not been um, really much data generated in this area is because it's laborious, it takes a lot of time, and it's not that exciting. <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but it matters. And so when they evaluated the defects, they looked at total volume resected, the percent of oral tongue resected, the percent of tongue base resected, the percent of lateral floor mouth resected, and the percent of soft palate resected. And what they concluded that percent of tongue base and total tongue volume resected most commonly correlated on swallowing outcomes in univariate analysis. And total volume resected, percent of lateral floor mouth resected, and radiation dose for, did matter for masticated boluses. And I think the thing that's probably most important for us that are also reconstructive surgeons is to know that in those patients that were reconstructed, they did better when the flap to defect ratio was close to one, which means if, if there's a volume defect, fill it, right? Restore the volume as much as you can to normal. So volume and mobility matter. What we don't know is the volumetric inflection point, one that provides, or that determines when a flap provides an advantage really is yet to be determined. There are cases that we reconstruct that we may actually be doing harm there are cases that we don't reconstruct, we probably are doing harm. We'd be nice to be more objective uh, uh, when we make that, that uh, determination. So it seemed that any time volume can be restored to the premorbid state without sacrificing function, that should be considered. All right, I'm winding down, I promise. Uh, sensate versus asensate. So Boyd very elegantly proved that near normal sensory density can be restored using neurosensory flaps uh, 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 with neurophys to recipient nerves. He did this in 1994. It was a very elegant study. You need to read it. He did this study where he did a radial form free flap to, do, to reconstruct a hemiglossectomy defect. And months down the road, they assessed the two point discrimination, hot, cold, and pressure sensation on the reconstructed flap, uh, the reconstructed tongue. And when they compared the density distribution of sensation in the intact form, contralateral form, they found actually that the reconstruction was more like the contralateral normal tongue than the form. So think about that. So there's pretty incredible central nervous system plasticity that went on that converted something that felt like this to something that felt like the contralateral normal tongue after transfer. Incredibly elegant study, but they didn't measure function. So what we don't know in those patients is, did that sensory restoration result in improved function? But you haven't set up any hope kit except. Soon after this, there was a whole host of papers that, that 
basically said, well, yeah, you know what? If you don't renovate a flap, they have sensation too. But when you look at the density of sensation in the non renovated flaps, it's nowhere close to that, that that is found in those patients that have sensory restoration purposely, uh, purposely restored. So again, no high level evidence of functional advantage of sensory restoration. That's work that needs to be done. All right, adjuvant therapy in, a, in, a, in two minutes or less. Um, when do you need to radiate a patient with oral tongue cancer? So there was a SEER database study done looking at T1, T2, N1 squamous cell carcinoma, 1,500 patients. Uh, the primary endpoint was to determine if adding radiation improved survival in this cohort. Uh, unfortunately, in the SEER database, the criteria for radiation was not available because it's retrospective. And what they found was overall survival for T1, T2, N1 oral cavity squamous cell carcinoma, no radiation with radiation. There was a slight difference in the combined group. When they looked specifically at T1N1, there was a, a bigger difference. And when they looked at T1N1, there was a smaller difference. So they concluded that post-operative radiation improved five-year <clears throat> overall survival in the group overall, 41.4% versus 54%. For T1N1 disease, adding radiation did not reach statistical significance, unlike T2N1 disease, where it was, where it was statistically significant. And adjuvant radiation improved overall survival in patients with T2 tongue disease, 52% versus 37%. So radiation uh, is clearly an advantage in T2N1, probably not so much in T1N1. And lastly, uh, what about chemoradiotherapy? A positive margin is a positive margin, right? So this study, which is the combined uh, data analysis of the European study and the American study looking at adjuvant chemoradiotherapy was a landmark study. It, it was a game changer for us. And when we, when we look at this, it was a game changer across all disease sites, oral pharynx, oral cavity, larynx, even skin, even cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, these principles were applied. When we look at this though, only a quarter of the patients had oral cavity cancer. So what I want you to think about is, uh, is that really enough for us to apply a paradigm shift to uh, how we treat our patients? We know that the, the criteria really that they looked at that was overlapped between both studies was positive margins and extra caps were spread. <coughs> and what we found overall survival, patients with positive margins and our EC and extra caps were spread. Um, radiation alone versus chemoradiotherapy, there was a significant difference. Without positive margin or ECE, no significant difference. But so this is a study that really changed everything for our patients when it comes to adjuvant therapy. And a T1 patient with a positive margin may end up getting chemoradiotherapy, whereas 15 years ago, they'd get radiation alone or re-resection. All right, so what's the best option for the T1 tongue cancer excised with positive margins? We're talking about, you know, adjuvant therapy or what? Well, re-resection is a reasonable option. So re-resecting with the scar of the, of the resection bed, representing the deep margin of the tumor, aiming for five millimeters from the scar, with or without selective neck dissection, if it hasn't been done, is probably the, the, a, a reasonable approach for a patient who has a positive deep margin or positive margin. Other options are radiation or chemoradiation. And when we look at NCCN guidelines, uh, in patients with a positive margin, uh, it's equally recommended for re-resection or radiation or chemoradiation. So uh, please consider re-resection of these patients that come to you with uh, prior excision with a positive deep margin or a positive margin in general, as opposed to pot potentially uh, radiation or chemoradiation. <laughs> All right, so in conclusion, with respect to oral tongue cancer, we have a lot of work to do. We need to optimize the methods of resection 
We need to get better. We need to better understand what is a clear margin. How should the resection specimen be analyzed? What's the role of frozen section? Maybe this would be a appropriate for a multi-sender randomized controlled trial. When is reconstruction appropriate and what kind? We need better objective data to help us determine that. And what's the role of adjuvant therapy? We need a better definition of the criteria for employing radiation versus chemoradiation in this group of patients. So that I'd like to really thank you for your attention. It's late on a Thursday night. So thanks again. Happy to take questions. Is there a difference in the original waste resection of the tumor versus the linear resection of the tumor as far as outcome? I've not seen that uh, described. I think um, my answer to that would be a radial distance is a radial distance, however you get it. <clears throat> because the, the corner of the wedge is narrower than the lateral <clears throat> margin of the specimen, right? Shaped like this. So radial margins are radial margins. So that's why you've got to, it's, it's got to be radial along the entire deep interface of the tumor. So if you, if you do a wedge, you're right. If you wedge it, you're going to be closer peripherally than, which is why it should, it should be, it should mimic the deep margin of the tumor grossly by a centimeter. I can go back and show the ultrasound. No, no, no. You get the picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please don't go back to slides. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Yes. Um, Flavio Oliveira, I'm one of the residents. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, just on the topic of resection <clears throat> revised to a negative margin, uh, the data you presented is very, very clearly shows that an initially negative margin is different than a, a margin revised or re-resected to negative. What seems less clear is whether an intentionally staged uh, negative margin is different from an initially negative margin because uh, in all of these situations, and, and this would be sort of in the, the model of the MOLOS approach, because in, I assume that in all of these studies, um, the revision to negative wasn't intentional, meaning that the fact that you had a positive margin at the outset makes the characteristics of the tumor and the patient or the situation different. Um, do you think that, for example, the role of uh, frozen sections, as you mentioned, or, um, or the benefit of getting an initially negative margin is really um, the key, or is it the fact that there's you know, possibly a difference? Meaning, if you were to compare an intentional approach to, to staging this, to trying to get smaller margins, and then, um, and then increasing the margins until you have a truly negative margins, would that be really different from uh, from just aiming to get um, initial negative margins? Yes, that's a great question. You know, on all these retrospective studies, you'll never know, right? Because the, how the re-resections were done was not standardized. How the pathology was analyzed, not standardized. So um, if you were to do that, so there, there are a couple of papers out of Canada uh, where they did a Mohs approach to oral cavity cancers, where they typically had a top positive deep margin. And then they went back and they did the, you know, the stages and they actually their local control rates were like 90%. They were really impressive. Um, but it's just so, um, it's so difficult for the way we have been trained to manage these tumors to say, I'm gonna go in and just cut right through the tumor. Now, in oral cavity cancer, I know that in laryngeal cancer, cutting through the tumor is, uh, is seen as a way to improve access, visualization. It's different for oral cavity cancers. But I think if you were to do that, you know, standardizing what you do with each stage uh, and making sure that you've got the right orientation, uh, there is a precedent, so it wouldn't be, you know, too crazy if you wanted to do it on a controlled, walk, a controlled trial. So Mark, that was really, really nice overview, particularly the handling the margin issue, which is really complicated in the first half there. The, um, the problem is, is that the frozen section is not really the same term. So um, a frozen section from the wound bed, if that's positive, that means that you're at, you actually have a positive margin. That is, yeah. the tumor is now extending through the tumor. Uh, 
Uh, the way that Vasu and Chris Holsinger have set up the frozen section analysis here is that it's actually a, a perpendicular wedge. So you're not measuring yes, no tumor, you're measuring a number, a distance from the tumor edge. So the, the clarity with which you get a positive or negative is very different compared to the kind of shade margin. So, so the fundamental problem is sort of a little bit what you're comparing. Um, so, so, so that was one question, but I did want to say to Flavio's question is really good too, because you can't, the, the data that Mark presented suggests that a, th a two millimeter margin is still positive. So when we think of Mohs for basal cell and for squamous cell, that's a zero margin. Like that is just that last tumor cell out of there. But when we look at radial margins, if you've got a less than two millimeters, that behaves as positive. It behaves as a positive margin. So I think the biology of the tumor is probably not the same that you can say as soon as you cleared that last tumor cell, it's clear because the way that the tumor cells invade the, the muscle or skin. So um, I, it's curious to know the small series where they do that. I, I just have a really hard time believing that this biology is the same as our cutaneous you know, right. Histologically, they may look the same, but they people don't die from T1 skin cancers right. like they do tongue cancer. So right. the stakes are higher. So I don't know what. I, so you're right with respect to the Mohs when they're cutaneous surgeons. A clear margin is a clear margin. Because I used to ask our Mohs surgeons, say, so what? So what's clear? It's clear. How many? <laughs> clear? So I got that last cell. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But uh, and so I don't. I have to go back and look at the papers. They were out of. Um, uh, one of the medical schools in Montreal. Thank you. Miguel. Yes, thank you. Duh. Um, <laughs> I'm from Missouri. Sorry. Uh, um, and I don't remember if they if they if they took if they looked at the radial distance on those different stages, right? I don't know. I because most surgeons it's on FOS, right? It's all on FOS. But you know, we I'm assuming you guys uh, you mentioned perpendicular is key. It's radial, right? Radial key. Yes. Yeah, great talk, Mark. Is a lot of interesting issues. Um, what do you think about differentiation with margins? We don't often talk about it much, but you know, the, the tumor edge is often in well differentiated, is more sharply defined and much poorly defined and poorly differentiated. Does that sort of vary how you think about margins? Well, so you know, um, Margie, you know, Margie Brandwine Gersler, she was at UAB for a while, yeah. right? Yeah, we worked together for a while. Yeah. Um, so uh, she did a pretty big study a few years ago, retrospective, that said radial, mar radial distance doesn't matter. It's pad of invasion and uh, PNI and lymphocyte density at the margin. So there's, you know, I, I'm sure that radial margins is way over, a way oversimplification that probably will still be adequate for 90% of the tumors that we encounter because they're really bad actors. Don't, they're not all that common. You know, I, I think of a case I did a few years ago that was a, technically a T1, um, uh, had a depth of invasion of eight millimeters. I had a centimeter deep margin. No, it's negative, uh, recurred. Something about that, you know, that particular tumor. So here's something I'll ask the group. Um, depth of invasion, generally we've really looked at that as a predictor of nodal metastasis, right? Um, but what about depth of invasion as, uh, as a predictor in its own right in patients with adequately clear margins? Is that still a higher risk patient? Patient with an eight or nine millimeter depth of invasion that you clear with a, with a centimeter? Is that a patient that you would still give adjuvant therapy for? Because technically, let's say it's a centimeter deep, that's a T3 lesion, but you've got a centimeter clear and there's no other worrisome characteristics. Does depth of invasion by itself, if you clear it, uh, is, is that a criteria or grounds for adjuvant therapy? Everything else being favorable. So one of our radiation oncologists published our experience with this and basically they said it doesn't actually, at least in our patient population, didn't make a difference adding radiation. DOI. Depth of invasion, yeah. For radiation does not. Depth of invasion alone is the sole prognostic factor for 
for like a bad actor. And they said it was. It, they said it would. It did not matter. Okay. For that group, but okay. I definitely think of tumors that are wider, deeper than wide. There's a totally different group of yeah. tumors that are wider yeah. than deep. Right. I, I, I definitely still. You, you could also ask that same question: Is should the margin be larger for tumors that have a higher depth of invasion? In other words, are they should you treat them differently from a right. margin right. perspective? Right. Right. Yeah, Mark, great talk. Um, Thanks. You in our conversation before you'd mentioned you're interested in window of opportunity trials with things okay. like Abelumab and and uh, if you do see shrinkage, what is your philosophy in terms of uh, reception? Yeah, I think uh, until we know, we have to go to the initial margins, I think. That, that would be my guess. I mean, the temptation is to do these trials so that maybe one day you could do a smaller resection. But until you know what's in that distance of tissue where the tumor is regressed, if it's regressed, uh, I think it's... Um, Probably unsafe to do anything less. It's hard to do though. Yeah, no. It's hard to do. It all looks normal. Mm -hmm. I know. Well, Mark, thank you very much. Thank you everybody for coming. So really, really